Hello, I am Brenda Harkins with Loud is Not a Language, and I want to welcome you to the VIP Roundtable Series, where we're talking about making your low points your launch pads. And that is what, what we have discovered is the best way uh, to do that is to recognize that you're a VIP. And what that means is to recognize your value and your victories so that you can know your voice, you can walk in your true identity, impacting with greater influence, and you can walk in your purpose with greater power and potential, all right? We all have the ability to do that. And I'm super excited that today we've got Joanna Hildebrand here with us to talk about what that has looked like for her. You're gonna love Joanna, she's fantastic. Joanna's uh, background is in mass communication and personal re public relations. She's on the board of directors for a Christian nationwide Christian sorority called Signify Lambda. She is uh, uh, the webmaster. She's a social media manager. She's a graduate <laughs> of Texas State University, uh, San Marcos. And uh, she is a mom and a wife and a good friend, and she's my friend, and I want to introduce you to her. Joanna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I'm excited too. I know you've got a lot that you have um, walked through that people that are listening are going to really resonate with, and so just thank you for saying yes to come and share with us. Uh, I want to start with with the V's, with one of the V's, especially what resonated with me when you and I were talking earlier was about your voice. And you were um, you were pretty quick to say that you knew that your voice, what, what that message is that you hear yourself saying over and over is you matter right where you are. Yeah. Did yes. you always know that? Um, you know, no, I don't think I always knew that. I think it's an evolution as everything is in our walk with the Lord, a process of figuring out what our voice is and the voice that he's given us specifically, because I think we have specific things that he's put on our hearts that we're passionate about that lead us in directions that the world needs. And it's taken me time to figure out what mine is. And I think what I have figured out really a lot for this season specifically in our world, a lot of the conversations I've been having with friends and, and coworkers is, processing through like, who are we now, you know, that everything's on quarantine or that our whole lives have been really transformed into this new thing that we're not used to. And a lot of the, the old ways of how we've connected with people and reached out or served our community have really changed and even maybe gone away. And so that can be really scary and we can really lose ourselves in that. Um, but the Lord has just been really I've seen in this season and in my life is that he has placed us specifically where we are for a reason. And even though it feels mundane and regular and ordinary and just like everyday life, but that there is such purpose for where you are specifically mm -hmm. and that we, we minimize our impact so much because we see big things that need to be fixed in the world and, and big issues that are calling and pulling at our heart. And we think, how on earth could I make a global impact? Or how could I even do something nationally to this big problem? And God has just told me, it matters what you do, where you're at, in your sphere, in your world, the people that you touch, the, the neighbors that you have, and the, the place where your feet go every day, it matters what you do there. And that is how the world is impacted. What we see and what we do, we're accountable for that piece. But I think a lot of times we really minimize the impact we make because it seems so small. And I would say it's not small because if we're all impacting where we're at, then the bigger picture gets impacted. Then and everything is impacted, right? Yeah. And so I think I just encouraging people that like you are where you are for purpose. You are where you are for this specific season, even if it's chaotic and really tough and really daunting. Um, but you're there for a reason and don't lose sight of that, even though 
the surroundings have changed, your purpose remains the same. And um, trust the Lord to lead you in that, even in, even in where we are right now. Wow, that's good. Um, that's good. You've wrestled, I know, with um, just through that whole, what is my value kind of thing. I know that there was a time that you had some dreams that seemed like the value was out there yeah. um, instead of right here where you are. And part of that, I think, you know, speak to whatever you want, but it, but what I see in looking at your life is that walking through one of the hardest things, probably the hardest thing you've ever walked through in your life and getting victory in that helped bring you back around to this place you just spoke to with your voice. Can you talk to us about that victory and how it certainly didn't feel like a victory in the middle of it? Absolutely. Um, you know, I graduated from college and I had huge aspirations for myself and big hopes and big dreams and careers I wanted to pursue, um, things I, that had been in my heart since I was a little girl. And then um, God blessed us with our first child, which was out of nowhere to us. It was totally a, a surprise to us, not to God. He knew. Um, and that threw my life into a trajectory that I was not anticipating as quickly as it came. And it left all those hopes and dreams over here. And now I was over here. And I just had a hard time reconciling where was I going and what was I to do now? And I'm a mom and how do I do this? But I still want all this over here. And so I was very much wandering and, um, we were early into our marriage and, and, and early on and um, it's 2006, quick, pretty quickly after my son was born, my brother, who's three years older than me, um, was, had just completed fire academy. He was going to be a firefighter. My dad had been a firefighter, has been all my life. And my brother was married at the same time I was married. We were all newlyweds together and trying to figure out our life as most people are in their 20s. And um, and he had just concluded his fire academy and he got sick in May. He was just real sick. And he was one of those people that when he got sick, he got real sick. And so we thought, okay, he just has the flu or something. And, um, out of nowhere, I got a call from him and he said, Joanna, I got a call back from the doctor and they think I have leukemia. And I was like, there's no way, like there's what? Like, you know, it's just so shocking. And anyone who's ever had that kind of news, you know, that like your first initial thought is denial. <laughs> of course, okay. it's like, yeah. No. yeah, there's no way. There's no way that can happen. And um, we thought, okay, there must be something off in the blood work, whatever. And pretty quickly, about 24 hours later, he started to decline rapidly and had to go into the ER. And then it was confirmed that he did indeed have a very aggressive form of leukemia, which was actually a childhood leukemia, which is strange because he was in his 20s, but they still considered a childhood leukemia. The unfortunate thing is, is as you get older, it is more aggressive. And so it took on a very, very aggressive form very quickly. And pretty much as soon as he was admitted, they were starting chemotherapy. And it began um, an 18 months of brutal, brutal treatment. Um, treatment I would, I would never wish on my worst enemy. The things that he had to undergo and the, um, the challenges and the constant just taking away of his physical body and fighting this disease that was determined to just wipe him out. And um, so like as any family does, when you're in the midst of that and you get that news, you go into fight mode. You just, you know, you have a, you have an enemy. Ours was cancer, it was leukemia. And that was what we were determined to go after and to fight. And that was spiritual. I mean, that was in prayer and in faith. Um, and that was physical and getting treatment and navigating this new world of cancer and, and, and having a family member that's struggling and fighting for their life, um, which just came out of absolute nowhere. And, um, I, my friends and I talk about this, you know, when you've had these situations in your life, I call it your bubble bursting. Like you've had this moment where you live in this bubble of like, okay, life is going on and okay. You know, yeah, you have some things in your life that have gone awry or some, some things, but 
there's a point in your life where your bubble bursts and all of a sudden the impossible has become possible and it shakes you to the core. And that could be trauma. That could be a, a, a diagnosis. That could be a lot of different, it could be divorce. It could be a lot of different things that has busted your bubble. And um, you, once your bubble has been burst, you, you look at the world a different way. Now, all of a sudden, if this can happen, what else can happen? And that stability that I had, and probably my naivety of being in my mid twenties of thinking that's someone else that's never going to happen in our life. I was faced with the reality, the, um, the very nature of our life being so tender and fragile and, and seeing my brother fight for his life. And so all of a sudden this, the stability I thought I had in the Lord, the stability I thought I had in my life, that my bubble had burst. And so I'm, I'm trying to reconcile this. So my brother's in treatment. He, you know, a good couple months into it, they get the news. You're technically in remission, which typically happens kind of fast. And then you do maintenance. And so we were like, okay, that's good. It responded. We're going to keep going. Um, so this is like, he was diagnosed in May. Now we're in like November. And I find out that I am pregnant again, out of nowhere. <laughs> God, God has a really funny sense of humor. I got to say, and um, I'm thinking, okay. And we had taken a test for um, my brother, my sister and I a couple months before in case he needed a bone marrow donor to see if one of us were a match. Your closest match is usually a relative, a, a sibling. And so we did that test and found out that I was his match. And it was kind of like our ace in the hole. If we need it, we have it there. So he was in remission. I found I was pregnant. Now we're, life is rapidly moving along. We're going forward and the, the new year comes around and he is not doing well. And things are really starting to go on and decline. And he goes to the hospital and, and gets checked in and, and doing a, a battery of tests. And he's having a lot, a lot of physical issues. Um, he coded a couple times and they come to find out the cancer is back. And the, um, the movement now is to bone marrow transplant. And I am par paralyzed because mm -hmm. I'm pregnant right. and my brother who is dying needs the bone marrow that I have in my body. And I remember before going to my first appointment for my daughter, I remember t asking the Lord and saying, please do not make me choose between my brother and my baby. Mm -hmm. I do not want to be in a position that I have to make that choice because he's here and he needs what I have and I'm pregnant and what is going on? Like, how yeah. could this be happening right now? And, yeah. and so I went to my doctor's appointment and I heard the heartbeat of my daughter and I was like, okay, God, I don't know what's going to happen. And my brother spent a lot of time in the ER, um, not the ER, I'm sorry, the ICU. He was on a ventilator for a long time. And the doctors were saying, okay, when he gets off the ventilator and he gets strong enough, we're, we're, it's bone marrow transplant time. And I'm like, Hey, I'm pregnant. So what do we do now? And, um, come to find out as he got better and, um, health, not healthier. He got stronger. He was dying. I mean, like, the cancer was killing him. And so we were on a time schedule. We needed him to get healthy enough to get a transplant. And so we were in conversations with the, um, the transplant team at Baylor Dallas. And they said, you can donate pregnant. And now we have never done it here before. So you will be the first one, but it can be done. We'll have to do things a little differently, but it's definitely an option. And I was like, done. I am confident that like, get me in that room. We'll take care of business. I know that I'll be okay. I know my baby will be okay. I've got, we've got to do this. And so it came mm -hmm. to summer and, um, uh, it was the end of June. I was literally seven, eight months pregnant with my daughter and we were the first pregnant bone marrow donation they had done at Baylor Dallas. And it went perfect. My I was perfect. My everything was great. Everything was great with my daughter. The they captured a lot of stem cells, like a great amount of stem cells that they needed. Um, the transplant, if anyone's ever walked through that, it is um, 
it is a brutal process for the person who's receiving. They have to basically wipe out their DNA and their immune system completely so that it can accept this whole nother immune system and DNA and all this stuff. And it went great. And um, we had great hopes that this was going to work and he, everything was grafting well and, and moving along and, um, his goal was to be out of the hospital so he could come visit me at the hospital when my daughter was born. And so we get to August 10th and he did it. He, by sheer will and determination, he was um, healthy enough and his counts were good enough for him to come to the hospital and be able to hold his niece, which is all that he wanted. And um, to visit me and to be able to walk out of the hospital since he didn't have to stay, that was like a huge victory for him. And um it was amazing. And my daughter's birth was life in the time that we needed new life to come into our family because we were fighting for life. And so to have this, this new, the juxtaposition of a new baby and, and while death is actively trying to steal a, a member of your family, it was such a, an interesting dynamic, but just her was just a revitalization for our family. So eight weeks later, I'm at home with, I have a two-year-old, I have a newborn and doing all the things that mamas do. And Jared, my brother calls me, he says, we got bad news that the cancer is back. And really the only option we have is to do, it's a Hail Mary, to do one more transfusion of stem, stem cells. <clears throat> he was like, and they're going to need to do it next week. And I said, okay, I'll be there. I'll do that. And I hung up the phone and I thought, I've got to wean my daughter in a week because I was nursing her and the, they were having to give me injections that were not going to be safe for her. And so I was like, okay, I'm, I got on the internet and I'm like, how do you wean a baby in a week? You know, and it was like, you can't I'm like, well, we're going to have to. And so, um, God being faithful, like it was actually like the smoothest process. He wired that girl to be able to, to navigate change quickly. It was just in her because he knew that the season she was coming in. And so she was such a contented baby. So she transitioned easily to a bottle. And the next week I'm taking injections to build up the bone marrow in my system so that they can do another harvest. And, you know, this transplant though, the first one, we were all like, yes, we're here. We finally got here. This is it. And this one was solemn and this one was somber because we knew that this was it. And that if this didn't work and this didn't take that, we didn't have any other options. So it was, it was just a really intense, intense time. So he got the stem cells. They did a great harvest of stem cells. I think a couple million, it's crazy how much they gather. And wow. Jared took it and it was, it was good. And then a couple of weeks later, the doctors just had a conversation with him and said, Jared, it didn't work. The cancer is still progressing and the cells are taking over the new cells and, and we are, we're, we are out of options. And that's really one of the worst things that any family member or anyone who's ever walked this out, the, the hardest thing to first hear is any sort of diagnosis. The second hardest thing is to hear that you have tried everything and there's nothing left. And he's in his late 20s and he has life and a wife and this new beginning. And all of a sudden we were like, it was gone. It was over. There was nothing left. And um, he, we sp soaked up our last couple of weeks with him the best that we could. And he passed away on November 3rd, early in the morning. And um, that moment just shifted me into the most grief and pain and sorrow I've ever had in my life that I've ever felt personally. I'd had grandparents pass away and I mean, I'd had experienced grief, but nothing like this. And um, I just was grieving and having this heavy, heavy sorrow. I didn't know what to do. I had two kids. I was in this life and struggling through just my own things and then to have this sorrow that was so suffocating right. that I didn't even know how to make it through and um and then to watch my parents mourn the loss of a child if you've ever had the unfortunate job of 
being a friend or watching someone grieve the loss of a child, that is a pain that is so untouchable to any other grief and to know that there's nothing you can do. So, you know, I'm mourning the loss of my brother, but then I'm witnessing the grief of the people I love, which was just as overwhelming. And, um, I just was also wrestling with God. You know, we had done the things we had prayed, the prayers we had stood in faith and, and, I was confident and trusting that God was going to come through and a, a miraculous healing. We and Jared believed that, and we all we were fighting and believing that. And if you've ever cried out and prayed for something and the answer didn't come, you're left in a really difficult place in your faith because everything I thought I understood and everything I thought I knew had really been obliterated. And we were at ground zero, and I thought. Oh, I don't know where to go from here. Like, I don't know what to believe and I don't know what to put my faith in. Um, I never went, I believed, I was like, I know that you are who you are. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> I believe that thing, but that's all I got right now is that thing. And I remember telling my husband, I said, I feel like whenever you were a teenager and you like really, really, really wanted something and your parents said, yeah, that's not going to happen. And you were just mad. And so you went into your room and you were still in the same house, but you were in different rooms and you just had this tension between you. I said, that's how I felt with the Lord. I felt like I was in this house and, and he had told me no, because I felt like it was a no. I felt like it was a personal, you said no to healing. And um, honestly, I'm probably still wrestling with that kind of got to move past that sometimes, but it felt like that in that season where I just, I was in the house with God. I believed in him, but I was not happy and I was un upset and really disappointed. And um, so I'm trying to figure out how do I grieve and how do I be a mom and how do I do these things? And I just felt within myself that I had to be very authentic to who I was. I had to authentically grieve, even if that meant in front of my kids. And I remember if I needed to cry, I was going to cry. And if I needed to just, you know, be there in a minute and, and just kind of have a second, I was going to have to try to do that the best I could while doing mom stuff. And I remember my oldest son being like, mom, why are you crying? And I miss my brother, you know, and, and I think it was healthy for my kids to see that, you know, it's healthy for them to see them, see you have feelings and process through grief. But mm -hmm. I was looking at the span of my life thinking he was 20, 28 or 29. And there's going to be so much time without him. Like most of my life will now be spent without my brother and, and the milestones and the things we're going to walk through, he won't be here. And it felt overwhelming just the amount of time that I was going to be away from him. And as I was trying to eat the whole pie of grief at once, I was trying to process everything at one time. It can't do that. <laughs> it gets really overwhelming. And I remember one day I was feeding my daughter, you know, if you've had a, a child, you're introducing foods to you, you know, you, you give them a spoonful and you watch their face and you watch their mouth. And you're making sure they swallow and they, and everything goes down. Okay. You know, it's a very intense first time you're kind of navigating. And I was feeding her and I'm watching her and the Lord just spoke really gently to me. And he said, this is how I'm going to help you through your grief. This is how I'm going to do it. It's going to be a spoonful at a time. You can't do the whole thing at once. You can't swallow all of it at one time and digest it. You won't be able to do it. So just like how you're carefully watching your daughter and watching everything as she's processing, I'm going to do the same thing with you. And I'm going to, and you're going to have a spoonful of grief and you're going to process that down and you're going to, and you're going to, it's going to sit in there and then we'll move on to the next spoonful. And it's going to be this, but I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to process it with you. You're not alone in that. And it was just, mm. it was the breath and the comfort that I needed in that moment to know that I had someone next to me, my savior, who was carefully watching over me as I was walking through my sorrow and through my pain and that I wasn't going to do it alone, but just as intently as I'm intently as I'm watching my daughter, he was going to do the same for me. Wow. And all of a sudden it felt like, okay, you know, when you have a friend who can walk through the pain with you, 
It doesn't make it easier. You still got to walk through it. You still have to feel all the things and all the pain, but it makes a difference to have someone next to you. And I had the comfort of Jesus next to me. And all of a sudden, the power of what it said in scripture about him becoming Emmanuel, God with us, became life to me because I, I wasn't promised an escape from pain and sorrow in this life. This world is broken. It's never intended how it's never what God intended it to be. And I don't get to pass over pain and sorrow. Even as a believer, I don't get to do that. But what the, the hope of my faith is, is that I have a savior who came in flesh, who dwelt among men, who felt the feelings and the grief and the pain and the sorrow and even sacrificed his life for my ransom, for my salvation. And so he understands and he came to be with us. And so now God is not far off where I have to go try and find him and, and perform to, to win acceptance and, and, and to be in his presence. Now Jesus came to be with me no matter what. Right there. Right there. And that to me became the gift of my faith. I don't understand healing. I'm gonna be real honest. I don't understand a lot of things for faith. They are a mystery to me. I probably understand less than I thought I did in my twenties. But what I do understand is that God is good and that Jesus came to save and he came to be God in flesh and dwelt among us and is with us. And that is the gift of my faith and my salvation. And so in the midst of my sorrow, I didn't get to fast forward through my sorrow. That didn't fast forward me through it. I had to walk through years of grieving and pain and wrestling and trying to, to navigate these things of my faith in the Lord and just everything. But God was there. And it wasn't these big things. It was in the quiet and in the moments where I just needed reassurance that he was present. A lot of times it was worship music, just playing. Um, but in those moments where you just were, where he, where I was getting another spoonful of grief and it felt overwhelming, God was like, I'm right here. I'm doing this. I'm right with you. We're going to walk through this together. And so I came out of you know, anyone who's grieved, you don't come out of grief. Grief stays with you forever. I miss my brother more today than I did 13 years ago. That pain never, ever goes away, but it changes and it, and it, it manipulates into something different. And so I carry that grief with me, but the intensity of the pain that was in the, in the first couple of years of loss, um, you know, it changes you and it changed. And so I had moved on in my grieving process, as most people should, and that's healthy and that's good. Um, but that, that idea of that, I now don't, I don't know what I'm going to walk through in this life. I don't know. I don't have a promise that I won't ever have more pain or, or more suffering or the, the unbelievable might land on my doorstep. I have no idea, but my faith isn't in the ability to, to escape those things. My faith brings me to a place that says, despite that thing, I will make it through because God is faithful and he is my companion and he is Emmanuel, God with me. And that is the only thing that makes me get through these challenges of our life. Wow. And so I think this year, I think our globe has had a collective bubble burst. I think we've collectively experienced this thing that we thought we were invincible to health, you know, health issues or viruses or that somehow we could control these things enough that it wouldn't impact our lives. And all of a sudden, this tiny virus has blown the bubble of the whole world. And we're, I think we're coming to terms with our lack of control and, and just our, the frailty of life. And I would say to you, it's a real thing that you're experiencing in this season. It's a real grief. It's a real fear that you're having to navigate through. But I don't ever want you to forget that like God came to be with you. So his presence with you is what carries us through this season. And whatever struggle or season that you encounter, no matter, don't ever think it's too small. It's never too small. It's always significant to the Lord. But it is a manual God with us is what we put our faith and our hope in. That is how we'll overcome the challenges of the world, the sorrows of this world. Um, 
the pain and the heartache and the betrayal of the world. It's through Emmanuel, God with us. It's through a father watching our face and feeding us and helping us process the things and the pain of this life and carefully tending to our hearts as he does so. Wow. And so that's, wow. that's the victory I achieved through deep, deep sorrow. Wow. That's horrible and beautiful. <laughs> the ugly, beautiful. I think um, Ann Voskamp calls it the ugly, beautiful. The ugly, beautiful. Mm. And it sure is. You know, I was listening to you talk about, especially when you were pregnant and you were um, going in and the, just the fear of I'm pregnant and I'm going to be doing a bone marrow transplant, just all of the things that probably the biggest, you know, physical fear, yeah. but the fear of what if it doesn't work, the fear of losing all of those things. I kept, what I kept hearing as you were talking was just the word courage over and over and what that really, really means, yeah. you know, it, because it certainly doesn't mean that we're not afraid. Oh, gosh, like, no courage courage is when we see what is we see the fear we stare at it we acknowledge it yeah. and we realize what's more important yeah. than the fear that's what courage is and that's what you did like that's that that what I was first hearing is that is your testimony you know mm -hmm. And it is the first part of your testimony, but even bigger than that is that he is near. Yes. Wow. Like in absolutely everything. Yeah. That's the gift of our salvation beyond, you know, obviously Jesus coming and taking my sin and my, my payment for what I owed for the, for my sin, taking that for me. The biggest tangible part of my faith is the fact that he's present and yeah. that, and that forever present, there's not a, that veil was torn, you know, and there's nothing to holding us back. And Jesus is the gift and the Holy spirit as well. Yeah. And, and even that is courage because yeah. as you talk about the spoonfuls that he was giving you, yes. you knew it was a spoonful of grief. Yes. Yes. And that's got to bring fear. Sure. And again, more, mm -hmm. What now, mm -hmm. you know, but him being with you mm -hmm. took precedent over that. It was, that was the more important thing. Yeah. And you leaned into that and wow, yeah. what a message for all of us mm -hmm. from that. Thank you for sharing that so much. Um, breathe here. <sighs> Wow. Um, okay. I'm going to drink of water. <laughs> okay. You do that. So through all of that, you, you had to have learned some major things about your identity. Yeah. And who you really are. Yeah. And I know that you saw from that, your, your influence having greater impact, even in what seemed like a really random thing that happened yeah. with a neighbor that moved in. God's even in the random. It's not, it just, it just appears random, right? Oh yeah, exactly. So can you talk to us about that? Sure. I can't, you know, so it was a few years later and um, we had moved into a new house and we had been there for a while and the house next to us had sat vacant for, I mean, I think it was a couple of years and no one had moved in and just kind of sat there. And, and then so all of a sudden an investor had purchased it and started, you know, re, re redoing it and getting all up to date. And I thought, Oh, okay, we're going to get some neighbors. And, um, and then a day in August, I, this family was moving in and, I um, went out and uh, met the mom and it was instantly like she and I just were like sisters from another mother. It was a perfect connection. And we just got chatting and they were from Canada, had newly moved to the United States a few months earlier and um, for a job and just got to know them and thought, oh man, I am so glad this neighbor is mine. I love her so much. And so um, we just kind of, you know, they got settled and we just kind of chit chatted over by the mailbox and did some stuff. And 
that was in August and we got into October, November, and I hadn't really seen them at their house. And it was kind of strange. And through a couple uh, running into her mother-in-law at the park, uh, they were walking the dogs and she was kind of lost. And I was walk, I walked her back to our house and she, I said, I haven't seen them in a while. And she said, well, their daughter who is a teenager is very, very sick and they're trying to figure out what it is. And, and they, none of the test results are conclusive or anything. And I said, oh my gosh, well, please keep me posted. I'm here if you need anything or whatever. And so instantly just started praying for them and really watching, you know, the movements of the house to see, you know, when they were home or whatever. And I think a week later they were home and the mom was outside. And I said, I've been praying for your daughter. Is everything okay? And she said, she just, you know, emotional. She said, they, they, um, they don't know what it is, but she has some rare, rare form of cancer and it, they just found it randomly. They've been doing all these tests. And so now we're starting treatment and everything. And I just like, it was one of those moments where it's almost like slow motion and pause. And I just was like, I'm so sorry. And I, I understand like where you're at and what can I do and just processing with her and just grieving over this diagnosis that was tragic. And, um, and so I was like, you know, exchange numbers for the first time. And I'm like, I'm here. If you need anything, please. I've walked through something similar. I, I, you know, if there's anything I can do, you know, please know we're praying or whatever. And it just began this process. And I remember walking into my house and thinking, this is really weird. <laughs> like, this is really strange because anyone who's walked through such pain and heartache and, and, you know, I know my pain compared to other people's pain is so small, you know, we all have different things, but you think, what was the purpose of that? You know, like why that? And what, do, wh why in life did we have to experience that? And, but that pain when you've had that pain, it allows you to be able to sit and pain with somebody else. Mm. Because if you haven't had that deep, deep pain, it's really hard to be able to sit in someone else's pain because you want to fix it. You want to do all these things. But when you've walked through that peril, like that perilous and paralyzing pain yourself, you know that all you need is just someone to sit with you in it because there's no solution that you can provide but you just need someone to be a companion in it. And I thought you moved a family from Canada here to this house that has never been occupied since we've lived here. And then within a few months, this tragic diagnosis for their daughter. And you put me here, like you placed me here to be a friend to her. And I felt overwhelmed with responsibility to love her well you know to yeah I, I realized like what God had had orchestrated and I wanted to to love her so well because I just knew the pain I mean I'm not as a parent but I knew what where they were navigating and it just began a, a few months and stuff of a just walking alongside, sitting in the pain, having those hard conversations, um, not having answers and just crying and processing, laughing, whatever you can do, just being a friend. And um, tragically within like, oh gosh, I think it was like six months or seven months, her daughter had passed away that the cancer was just, and I just was witness and friend to this unbelievable, terrible situation. You know, I thought my, our situation with my brother was terrible. All of a sudden you realize, Oh, I didn't have it that bad, which is so weird. But you know, if people have walked through pain, you, you realize that like, there are people who have it harder. There are people whose stories are, are, are way more intense than yours. And, and it helps give perspective, but it also helps you be a good friend just to be able to sit in that with her. And, um, and so all of a sudden I realized that there was purpose to my, to the pain and, and it wasn't because I was able to help do anything different. I couldn't solve the problem or make it better or do anything. I just was able to sit in the pain with my friend 
who was suffering with unbelievable grief of losing her daughter. And, um, and I thought, you know, I had had hopes of like, I really am tired of being a stay at home mom. I mean, be real honest. I was like, I'm tired. I'm done with this. I want the career that I put on hold the, the dreams that I've had. I'm, I'm real ready to move on to that. And, um, you know, thankfully I have enough restraint to not just go out there and make some happen, but it was in that season that I realized had I been working, had I been at a full-time job, juggling three kids, all those things, I would have had zero availability to be a friend to my neighbor and to help when there needed to be help or make meals or whatever. And, you know, in the mundane and in the ordinary and the things that you think, this is just monotonous. Like, is this really my life? Is this what I'm doing? God has orchestrated your path in ways you have no idea. And that in a way that he could move someone right next door to you for a reason. And it all became really clear, clarified for me. And I kind of stopped whining about it and stopped complaining about it. And I just realized there is a time and a season for everything. And there is a time and a season for um, being a friend to someone, but more importantly, like don't force things to happen because you want it to happen. Be patient in the season because you have no idea what God is orchestrating in the background where he's like, I need you to be here right now. And if you go make your plans over here, you're not going to be here when I really need you to be here. And so it kind of gave me a little bit of a check to say, okay, I surrender again. I, I surrender. I, I, I got it. Like, I'm going to listen intently to your leading and I'm not going to run ahead of you. I'm going to keep pace with you because you see more than I can. And, um, and that is one thing that I've just really saw happen in, in, in real time is that nothing is wasted at the Lord. You know, even our pain, even the, the tragedies that we've navigated in our life um, that we don't have answers for that still don't make sense. That still hurt so bad that God uses all those things um, because he loves his people and he will put you in positions because he knows that you have something that someone else needs. And even your pain is worth is, is necessary and, and is helpful to someone. And um, learned so much in that season about the sorrow and the pain and the thing I walked, walked through with my brother, um, allowed me just to be able to be present and to sit with my friend. And, um, sometimes you just got to be able to sit in it with people. And that that's a gift. That's, that's a gift Yes, because we want to talk and we want to make it okay. And yeah, we want to do that a couple of times. I was like, Joanna, stop talking, you know? <laughs> But yes, I mean, it's, we want to do something yes. and there's not anything you really can do except be there and, and realizing what a gift that is yes. just yeah. being there. Yeah. Um, you have, you mentioned about the difference in pain levels, you know, of our different experiences. And I've shared this before, but I think it's relevant right now to say again that a good, really good friend of mine was uh, sitting beside, sitting with her sister in the hospital who was dying of cancer, and she, her sister was in severe pain, and my friend had been up all night long, um, just tending to her everything that she needed. Her head was pounding, and she's trying to ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. Let me just take care of my sister. You know, her head was just pounding and without thinking, she said, gosh, I've got a headache mm. and immediately thought, oh, how stupid. <laughs> My sister is dying of cancer and I'm saying I have a headache. And I thought this was so precious what her sister did. She looked at her and she said, sissy, pain is pain. Go take care of your headache so you can help me deal with my pain yeah. you know what a precious gift for her at right. that time um 
that's what this is about too. You know, like this is just about not comparing, you know, wow, I haven't been anything through anything like Joanna has or whatever. It's not about comparing our pain, but it's about seeing how others have gotten through it, yeah. how you've gotten through it, how you stepped into the courage of seeing what was more important than the fear and how you leaned in to, even when it didn't make sense, knowing the Lord was near, you know, yeah. and, and just him unfolding that you have a house next to you for two years with nobody living in it. And he sends somebody from another country who just happens to have a daughter mm -hmm. going through what your brother did. And you just happen to be the gift that she needs. I mean, he's truly so present. So all of that, that you walked through um, for her, as much as you wish you wouldn't have had to walk through it, what you walked through for her, it was a gift mm -hmm. because you were able to relate. It made your influence so impactful mm -hmm. because you had embraced what you needed to, to get through it. And so, you know, when I think about the, the P part of, of the VIP and that it's, you know, it's, it's so all of that, is so that we can live out our purpose in power to the greatest potential. And when I, I think about your um, purpose, I think that it must be something like impact what you can, where you are from the experience you've lived. Yeah. That's a powerful purpose right there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that's what you're doing. And that's what you've done. And um, I just want to thank you for sharing that because that that's super powerful. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that that's people are just resonating with that in many different ways as they mm -hmm. listen to this. Um, but I am there is now possibly another adventure. <laughs> that you might be stepping into. Um, I'm telling you, I mean, I don't know. I'm praying for what God has for you. <laughs> but um, politics for parents, and this is not about, this is nonpartisan, so don't run away anybody. You know, this woman right here, if you have not noticed, is the perfect person to do an unbiased informational hub on political issues. And that's what the politics for parents is. It's for busy parents, like, yeah. like you've described. You're just trying to feed your kids and get them what they need and do this and that, you know, juggle this and that. And parents don't have time to look at the issues. So no matter what side of the street you're on, you know, on politics, doesn't matter. Your heart is to be sure people are informed and can vote yeah. according to their conscience. Because it's important where we, in, and we live in a great country where we can do that. And so you are, I'm sharing that because Joanna's not sure if she's going to step into this yet or not, but, um, but even in processing that, how have the experiences that you've been through, like, how are you even processing that differently than you would have a few years ago? Um, you know, I think one thing that I've realized, so I'm a total political junkie. I love politics and it's not like one way or the other. I'm just fascinated by the whole thing. Um, and it came out of a, a desire to, I had friends who are college educated, smart people who just had no time to dig through all of the information and get the bones of what was really going on in our world or legislatively or whatever. And I thought that'd be kind of fun to like, kind of be a person who can kind of take some information and just really like bullet point it. So they feel confident, like when they're, you know, pre COVID dinner parties or whatever, <laughs> they can be participate in conversations or feel like they're educated in what's going on without a, a narrative being driven to them. And um, 
I'm a mass communications major. I took a lot of journalism classes and I was seeing, you know, where the state of journalism is now. It, it really drives a narrative and, and you don't see a lot of, of news reporting or information that's just purely information like boop, 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 boop. Here you go. You're smart enough to figure out what you think about that. Right. Figure out what you think about that. But here's the information. And so I kind of came out of that and I started um, Brenda definitely was a catalyst. She kind of pushed me and was like, come on, you got to do this and help me brainstorm and really was my cheerleader as she's doing now um, to, to start this. And so I launched this um, a website and then like Facebook page and stuff and just started kind of putting out some information. And um, it was, it was well, you know, received by, you know, my sphere of people and began kind of taking on. And then, um, you know, as life does, a, transi a transition came and God called me to work at um, our local high school. Um, I needed to go back to work. I needed to help with the family, um, you know, income and stuff. And this was an opportunity to stay on my kids' schedules, but be in the school system that they would eventually be in once they got older. It was a total open door. And um, I said, yes. And I, I walked through that door and um, God has used me over the last couple of years to work the front office of a high school. I call myself the chaos coordinator. It's like <laughs> Grand Central Station, always walking through there. And um, God has allowed me to use my skills and my abilities to really impact my community. It's my people. These are my students that are in my neighborhood and the teachers that live near me. And these are the, this is the uh, high school my kids will go to. So it was very personal, like an opportunity to really pour into my community. And I took it personal. I took it very like every parent that walks in that door is, is important and valued and, and someone in my community. So I have the opportunity to, um, to help them and to service, you know, to be of service to them and to get to know students. And all of a sudden, you know, the pulse of kind of what was going on in our community, the challenges of the students, the challenges of what's happening in their lives and just, and it became very evident. Um, so God had been using, has been using me in that place. I've been able to take my communication degree and just use it there freely. And thankfully I have an administration team who loves that I have that and, and utilizes that. And so it's been a lot of fun to, to be able to make impact at that. Um, and so politics for parents kind of went, on the wayside a little bit. And in the season of elections, it's, I really wrestled with the necessity of another voice out there. There's just so much chaos and talking and people spouting their opinions and just information. And I really wrestled with, should I, should I put stuff out there? Should I start doing that? And I really felt that there was an intention for not going there this season that by not, by not stepping out there, I was also choosing to really prioritize some relationships in my life, like family and friends, you know, everything's so divided right now. And on a lot of different issues, not just party, but you could pick one issue and everyone's gonna have a different feeling about it. And I've just seen relationships torn apart. And I was like, can't contribute to that, even though that would never be my heart. That would never be what I wanted to do. I just felt like a, my voice would get drowned out in the sea of voices of what's going on right now. And so maybe I was right. Maybe I was wrong. I don't know. <laughs> but I chose to kind of step back from that and kind of quiet myself on purpose because I just didn't, I just didn't think it was the right time. So yeah. I don't know what the future holds for politics for parents. I have hopes and dreams. I love, you know, there's, there's other hopes that are beginning and dreams are beginning to percolate on this end. And, you know, like everybody, we're in the process of something, you know, you get bits and pieces of where you're supposed to head and maybe what something will look like or not. And so I don't know. I don't know where I'll, where I'll be. I know that it has my heart and my passion still, but what that will look like in this new season is, is kind of up, up in the air. <laughs> well, I think that, I think that um, it's important to point out that um, so many times people think your purpose is that one thing that you do, right? you know, and that I think with all that you have shared, it's such a beautiful picture of 
when we're talking about purpose, we're talking about how you live your everyday life. It's not that thing out there. It's what's in here. And so you impacting what you can, where you are with what you've got inside of you is your purpose. And that's what you're doing, you know? And so when there's a time for politics for parents, when there's a time for politics for parents, um, I trust that the Lord will show you that as well. But um, thank you so much for sharing everything that you have. It's such an encouragement. If there was one thing that you could say to the people that are listening that might just end this year with some hope and encouragement, leave it on an upswing, what would you like to leave them with? Just want to say is that you are important, like where you are, the space you, you fill, the place where you are in your, in your, your physical home and in your job and in just in your life, it matters. God has a plan and a purpose for you and don't ever disqualify yourself because you feel that your impact is too small. It is so important that you understand that your impact is important to the kingdom of God. And if we all understood that, that meal you took to your neighbor or that just friendly hello or whatever, standing up for someone, you know, anything, whatever that looks like for you, it makes a difference and you make a difference. And so we may never be able to personally impact these huge things in our world, but the impact you get to make where you are that is huge. It is huge to who you are and it's huge to the people around you and they need you mm -hmm. and your voice is important and, and the things that you do and the kindness that you bring and the love and just who you are, it matters and this world needs you and your little sphere needs you and, and God put you right there for a reason. So if you are stuck in the mundane and I understand and you feel like, I am so tired of doing the same thing every day. And why am I here? And what is the purpose? I would just say, God, open my eyes. Let me see where you have me. Where, what do you want me to do? Why am I here? And here's the thing I know. He will speak to you. And it's usually really small and really <laughs> quiet or something really random. You'll just catch your eye and you're like, what, what is that? He is he's not hiding himself from us. He is in plain sight speaking to us. And so if you're desperate for information or answers or just a hello, I'm here. Do you see me? Ask. He was faithful to do it. And his purpose for you is good. And it has a plan. And don't ever discount it if it feels too small. There is no too small in the kingdom of God. There just isn't. And you matter and you are important. And so be confident in where you're at, even if it's in the mundane and regular, that is where God shows up all the time. And there are people around you need you. So your voice matters and your purpose matters. And if you're desperate for just something, cry out to the Lord, call a friend, stand with somebody and ask them to help you see what is the one thing in front of me that needs me other than my kids or my husband <laughs> or whatever. What is one thing that calls me, just me and how you wired me? What, what do you need from me in my world right now? And um, I know he'll show you. He's been faithful to do it. So great. Thank you so much, Joanna. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your heart <laughs> so openly. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for being here and watching. If you are interested in exploring more of what your voice and influence and purpose looks like, go to loudisnotalanguage.com and check out some of the coaching services there. You can email me directly at brenda at loudisnotalanguage.com. Uh, I will pass anything along to Joanna that you might have to uh, say to her as well. And um, just thank you. Joanna, again, Thank you for the opportunity. So very, very much. And you all stay tuned for the next session of um, the VIP roundtable series. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.